Good morning. If you would turn in your Bibles to the fourth gospel, John chapter 13, we'll read selective portions from the text. John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper and laid aside his garments, In taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Dropping down to verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also or to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. December the 7th, 1970, 
Almost 50 years ago, Willy Brandt, the German Chancellor, made his way to Warsaw, Poland. As he came to Poland on that day in Warsaw, he went out to a memorial, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Memorial, and there he laid a wreath. And then after laying the wreath, he had something that stunned the press that were around him and the political dignitaries. He fell to his knees. And he remained there for about half a minute in this act of penance, in this act of humility, this world figure on his knees. Later being interviewed by the press, he gave the reason for that and translated into English, he stated these words. Under the weight of recent history, I did what people do when words fail them. In this way, I commemorated the millions who were murdered. Well, we come to a familiar passage in the fourth gospel this morning. We come to find Jesus washing the disciples' feet, the king on his knees, taking a basin of water and washing the begrimed, soiled feet of his Galilean seminary students. As we explore this passage this morning, though, we need to understand the context of the text, the background. When we come to John's Gospel, we come to a Gospel that stands at a distance away from the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The portrait of John's Jesus is radical, provocative, and different to that of the canonical Gospels. Robert Kaiser remarks that John's Gospel is a maverick Gospel. It's a Gospel where John seems to omit details that the other three Gospels have about the life of Jesus. In John, there are no birth narratives, infancy narratives, stories. There's no baptism in John's Gospel. There's no temptation. There's no Gethsemane. But God, John brings to the portrait of Jesus fresh material that is not in the other Gospels. We have the first sign, the couple rescued from social stigma in the wedding ceremony at Cana. We have the puzzled Sanhedrin theologian coming to Jesus at night, and Jesus says to him, you must be born out of thin, again, from above. We find Jesus sitting in a well, Jacob's well at Sychar, at high noon. There he talks, throws aside all social taboos, talks to a Samaritan, a woman, and is willing to drink from her utensils. As we progress through John, we see the man who lay for 38 years at the pool, Bethesda, and Jesus says, pick up your mattress and walk. We find the man who is born blind, and Jesus comes and gives him sight. We find Jesus at the cemetery in Bethany, raising Lazarus after four days. This John's Gospel brings to us a different portrait of Jesus. The structure is important. We find a prologue in the first 18 verses. We find an epilogue in chapter 21. And in between we have two portals, two vistas, the book of signs in 1 through 12. The book of glory in 13 through 20. These books are vistas into the Jesus of history. The book of signs provides us with clues and guideposts. As we look at Jesus, the sent one, the divine apostle, the one who has been sent as courier by God to narrate God, to be the sermon about God, to be the exposition of God through signs and clues as to what God is like. Look at the sun and you see God. Jesus is God spelt in language that we can understand. He's the human face of God in the book of signs. But in that book of glory, we hear the golden echo, the the golden thread of glory. This one who will ultimately end up on a cross, 
the Son of Man lifted up on a tree of shame. And for John the Evangelist, this is the moment, the apex of ultimate glory. The suffering love of God on a cross. In the book of Signs, John is preoccupied with a public ministry to outsiders. For he will take the Jewish religious calendar and he will frame the canvas and he will argue against that Jewish calendar that I, Jesus, am the fulfillment of this religious calendar. In the book of glory, he will move from public ministry to private ministry. The upper room will be his camp David. And here in the book of glory, we will have within 24 hours the biography of Jesus. Have you ever read a biography where half of the biography is about the last 24 hours of a person's life? Well, come to John. Let's look carefully at the book of signs and the book of glory. And as we open the door, as we open the portal of the book of glory, as we read from John chapter 13, verse 1, it's as though John introduces a brilliant artist who fills in the background for us with three strokes, quick strokes of the brush. Understand the three strokes of the brush in verse 1, and you'll get the meaning of the foot washing and the book of glory. Well, that first stroke of the brush is in that opening phrase of verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover. Now before the feast of the Passover. We've heard the Passover motif through the book of signs. For Jesus is the Passover lamb. Go back to chapter 1 verse 29 verse 36. John the Baptist sees Jesus coming and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Come stand with me in John chapter 2. And there Jesus, John bringing the event forward, stands at Passover and judges the temple. And says that this temple will be destroyed and rebuilt in three days. And they scoff and they mock him because they do not understand that he is not speaking about Herod the Great's temple, but he's speaking about himself. Come to John chapter 6, there on the Galilean hillside, the crowd is hungry. He takes five loaves and two fish, and he feeds the multitude and gives us this esoteric, mysterious teaching. You are to eat my body and drink my blood. At Passover, that was the moment. In 13.1, we come to the final Passover in John's chronology. Here we stand in Jerusalem. The first quick stroke of the brush. But there's a second found in verse 1. Jesus knowing that his hour had come. This Jesus who seems to move in John's gospel to the divine whisper, the whisper of the Father, of God that he alone can hear. This Jesus who seems to See a clock face moving and hears the chimes and the clock ticking that no one else hears. This Jesus who marches to the beat of his own drum, the divine schedule, waits for the hour. Well, we've heard the hour before. Go back to John chapter 2. Mary wants to intercept Jesus at this crisis moment with a couple that run out of wine. Jesus remarks in 2.4, Mary, mother, my hour has not yet come. In John chapter 7, his brothers taunt him and say, Go up to Jerusalem, flex your messianic muscles. And he responds, My hour has not yet come. But when we come to the book of glory, when we open the vista, Jesus knowing that his hour had come. Come. Jesus knows that the clock has struck midnight. The hours of sand have gone through the hourglass. He knows that his hour has come, and the text tells us that he would depart out of this world to his Father. 
This one who was with God in the opening verse of the gospel, this one who was God, this Logos who became flesh, the one who tabernacled among us, will pitch his tent among us for some 30 years. This one who knows as you read verse 3 that all things have been given to him and who knows that he has come from God and origins is so important in John. This one who has come from God knows that he is going back to God. Origins and destiny come together. But this word become flesh knows that as he departs from this world and goes home, there will be a sequence of shattering events. There will be arrest, crucifixion, death, resurrection, ascension before he goes home. Well, there's a third stroke of the painter's brush in his opening verse. We read it from the text. Having loved his own, who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Love them to the end. You might translate that temporarily. He loved them to the end of his life. This was a dogged, see it to the end kind of love. A love to the limit. Or perhaps it's an adverbial phrase. He loved them completely. He loved them to the nth degree. He did everything that love could do for them. Hadn't he mentioned in John 10, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The foot washing. The event that we've read about is a precursor. It reaches. It reaches on towards what will come. It stands surety of that Calvary love that will follow in the next hours. If you wanted to write one word across Jesus' life, write the word scandal. For there in the beginning of his days, there in Nazareth, this adolescent Jewish peasant girl hears that she is going to be the one that will give birth to the Messiah. There will be no human partner. This is divine decree. And there's scandal as this little Jewish cousin girl in this hamlet called Nazareth grows up and feels within her own being, beneath her heart, as deep in humanity coalesce and cohere. Scandal, whisper, stigma. But then when Jesus goes out into public ministry, there is the scandal of his teaching, there is the scandal of his actions. He teaches his disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, honored, treasured be your person, not Caesar, not Tiberius, the emperor of that day. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come, not the kingdom of Rome. The scandal of his offering of teaching, the scandal of his actions, going in and turning over the sacred cows of Judaism, the temple. What right does this Palestinian iconoclast have to do to turn over the tables of the temple? He has no rabbinic letters behind his name. He has a robe from Galilee. Who is this one that tramples on holy things? The scandal of his birth, his teaching, his provocateur, the scandal of his death. Romanized, he is a seditious rebel. And seditious rebels end up on a Roman cross. In the eyes of the Jews, he is a subversive prophet. He cannot be tolerated. Scandal laced throughout his journey, his earthly life. Well, we've done the homework, we've done the back work. Now we can get into the text, the meaning of this event. In the ancient Near East, the roads were narrow. The roads were crowded with humanity. Some of the roads were paved with cobblestones, most of them were not. As you walked as a pedestrian through the crowded streets of that day, there would be refuse. There would be dogs that had left excrement. 
It was extra that had been thrown out of the higher floors of buildings. The only protection that a pedestrian had was a slab of leather, a sandal. And as you walked through the streets of that day, if it hadn't rained for days, there would be dust, cake dust, inches thick on the roads. If it had rained, there would be mud like a bog. So the one who walked across the streets of that day would have, as a matter of protocol and etiquette, come to the house and take a pitcher of water and clean the feet. Often in the Jewish days, a Gentile slave would have that menial task of cleaning soiled feet. On this particular occasion that John writes about, the disciples are naked in the upper room, and their mood is not to wash the other disciples' feet. For why should we do that? That would be a glaring admission of inferiority. And Luke tells us what their mood is when they come up into this upper room. They are dialoguing, they are debating, they are jostling for power. Who is the greatest? Who is the one that stands tall among the group? How little these Galilean seminary students have understood. It's incredulous. Jesus must have been sore, heart sore, stunned. Here's the cross of shadow reaching down towards him, imminent, and yet they're talking about greatness. And so Jesus says, if they will not, I will. The text says that he got up in the midst of this meal, during the meal. The protocol has not been fulfilled by the disciples. So he gets up, lays aside his garments. He would lay aside his garments, throw out a garment, in a garment, stands in a loincloth, a servant's dress. Takes a towel around his waist, with one end out, pours water into a basin, and begins to wash the disciples' feet, the king on his knees. Paul writes in that Christological passage to these church at Philippi, the first church in Europe, that this one called Jesus will not snatch, will not clutch, will not exploit equality with God as Adam and Eve attempted to do. But this one will empty himself, not claim like the emperors did to be deity. This one who is God will empty himself and he will take the form, the role of a bond slave, a doulos. He will fulfill the protocol. He will love to the nth degree. And it's not that deity exchanges the form for that of a servant. Deity is expressed, revealed in the form of servanthood. Read verse 3. All things are given to him. The sovereignty and authority and care of the king is on his knees. While he will ride into Jerusalem a few days earlier, the king on a donkey, he will be on his knees and he will wash the disciples' feet, the king on his knees, and the king will hang on a tree of shame. The one who has all power and authority will empty himself. He will take that towel and he will wash the begrimed, soiled feet of his disciples because a few hours later he will wash the begrimed and soiled hearts of those Galilean disciples and all humankind. Because the insignia, the badges of kingdom, the kingdom of God, are not crowns and scepters, but basins and towels. John's literary features are stunning. He uses irony. He uses double entendre, double meanings. 
Some have said that you can read John's Gospel and an infant can wait around in the text with delight. Some have said John's Gospel is so deep you could drown an elephant in it. Here's the double entendre in this event. There's an ethical directive, an ethical injunction, and there's a theological lesson. The ethical directive... I have given to you disciples who failed the final test. Here's the example. When you travel through the course of life, through the contours of life, learn how to serve. Wash people's feet. This is not a third ordinance. This is a cry to each one of us today. As you travel through this day, this week, this month, this year, wash people's feet. What does that mean? Well, let me go to the Quaker, Richard Foster, his classic book on the celebration of discipline. Chapter 9, he has illustrations of how to serve with humility. The discipline of service. Let me give you a few. One, serving with hiddenness. Our flesh whines, whinges against service. Our flesh screams against hidden service, Foster writes. We pull, we strain, we want to be acknowledged, we want people to know how we've served, we want to notch our guns. Serve with hiddenness. He goes on. Service must be without equivocation. No yes, but... There's a difference between serving, choosing to serve, and being a servant. When you choose to serve, you're in control. You determine when you serve and who you serve. You've kept the power. You can work the circumstances and contingencies. But when you become a servant, you give away control. There's freedom, but there's vulnerability that comes with it. Third, he says... Service with little things, small things. How often we complain about the interruptions of our day. And God brings into our path people who need a divine touch of grace. These divine serendipities, Foster writes, the real issues are often found in the tiny insignificant corners that frame our lives. Look for the time in the insignificant corner because they may be the fundamental for how do you serve? Guard the reputation of others when they are absent. Wow. Guarding the reputation of others when they are absent. Hold the tongue. Don't leak the gossip, the rumor. Number five, common courtesy. The rituals of relationship. Answering emails, answering the phone call, writing a letter, caring about the rituals of day-to-day relationship with others. And the last one, How do we serve? How do we wash other people's feet? Quaker Foster says, listen to others. There's so many that are out there starving and yearning for empathetic listening. But all we've got is half impatient listening. We don't listen well. What we've got is this impatient Perhaps part of our mind and being given to the listening speaker. Henry Nguyen teaches us so well here. The Roman Catholic guru said in his day, if you listen, you allow the stranger to cast off his or her strangeness into, into your space. You know what John 4 is all about? That Samaritan woman who runs back to the village and says, Come see a man who for the first time in my life listened to me. Jesus 
knew how to stop and listen. We are lost in our frenetic hustle and bustle of our lives. Well, here's the closing question. Has Christ washed you, cleansed you? Because if you go to the theological illustration, I'm giving you the ethical. Peter and his obstreperousness and his typical rashness says, Kuriya, Su Mu, Lord, Master, you, me, wash? No ways. Jesus says to Peter, theologically, if you want to be part of me, if you want to belong to me, you better submit to me. Because what I'm doing here is a foretaste of Calvary love, which is coming in a few hours. The foot washing reaches forward to the sacrificial cleansing love of God. For here in the upper room, the king will stoop, the king will kneel, the king will go as Passover lamb and be slaughtered on a Roman cross. For whom? For you and for me. He will die on the tree. He will clean, cleanse us from all our moral filth and guilt. So I have to ask the question, have you been washed? Have you been cleansed? Have I been washed? Have I been cleansed? Has the gift of grace, God's signature, been written across our lives? And Satan's graffiti has been removed. Pride must perish. Only the blood of Christ can save us. His sacrifice offered for us on the cross needs to be received by an act of personal faith. Admit today, I need to be washed. I need to be cleansed. Robert Falcon Scott left New Zealand in the year 2010 seeking the truth. As he eventually came on the 18th of January, 1912, to the point of the South Pole, he found that five weeks earlier, a Norwegian by the name of Amundsen had beaten him. As this depressed crew of five tried to make their way back to base camp, they died in the snow in the Arctic, Antarctica, the Antarctica. When news reached Britain, they held a memorial service for Scott and his men. Ten months earlier, there'd been a memorial service for the Titanic deceased. But this day, the King of England went to the memorial service. King George V and his Prime Minister at the Sweet. And they came to St. Paul's Cathedral, and it was a somber service, but it was a moving national service. And the Times of London wrote about the service, and at the end of the article, they cited a poem as though the King, George V, was appealing out to the lost explorers who were lost in the Antarctic South Pole graveyard, the wasteland where their bodies lay. The words of the poem of this dramatic king appealing to the deceased explorers from England were, Can you see the dome? The dome of St. Paul and the cross above St. Paul's Cathedral. Can you see the dome with the cross and then the last line? And can you see our king, King George V, on his Well, John 13 says to us this morning, Can you see the hill, the skull, called Golgotha, and Jesus the King on the tree? Dallas Willard, the man of profound faith, the late Dallas Willard, Professor of Philosophy at, at, at almost Ivy League, USC, California. Professor of Philosophy, specializing in phenomenology, writing books about spiritual formation, was on one day asked by a doctoral student this question. 
Professor, why do you who are so intellectually thoughtful and well-educated follow Jesus? Willard, with his humility and characteristic simplicity, responded, Tell me, he said to the inquiring student, Who else? Who else do you have in mind? Let us pray. Father, make us restless with the sameness and the mediocrity of our lives. Drive home the truths that we have heard this morning, that we have a king who is willing to wash our hearts clean. We thank you for the offer of grace. We thank you for the offer of astounding love. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.